Welcome to this evening's Alumni and Friends webinar, Positioning the Faculty for the Future, U of T Dentistry's new satellite clinic. I'm Selena Estevez, the Director of Advancement. Advancement, of course, includes fundraising for the priorities of the school to help ensure our future sustainability and to build on the excellence expected from, from our school and also alumni relations, which is about engaging our alumni in programming and all our activities. It really is so great to have a broader, broader audience attending this evening. Because of the nature of this unique and special project, we've invited our alumni, our students, our faculty members, instructors, and community partners to join us to hear about the faculty's new and exciting project, the Satellite Clinic. We're all so excited about this project, which will further enable our teaching and patient care. It has been decades since the faculty celebrated a new large clinic, and the creation of this space will be a spectacular addition to our clinical operations. So some housekeeping before I introduce our speakers for this evening. Like always, we'll send out a post-event survey for your feedback. Please share your thoughts with us. Our job is to provide engaging programming and your feedback really helps us do that. Also, as a reminder, you may send in questions using the Q&A function. We received a few in the future, or in the, <laughs> we received a few, previously, but tonight you can also send in your questions. So as you hear the information from Jim and Mary, feel free to share, to reach out. Um, and we expect tonight to wrap up in about 45 minutes. So with us tonight, we have our faculty experts who are leading this project brilliantly, and they will share some details and answer questions about this clinic and the overall project, as well as some upcoming plans for 124 Edward Street. I'd like to introduce Mary Choi, our Assistant Dean Administration, who is the lead on this project, and also Dr. James Poslins, our Director of Clinical Operations. Both Jim and Mary have been instrumental in coordinating this massive undertaking. They've collaborated with dozens of stakeholders to ensure the clinic will meet and exceed our needs for at least the next decade. Welcome, Jim and Mary, and thank you all for being here. Mary, I'm gonna pass it over to you to get us started, and I will see you all shortly. Thank you for having me. As Selena said, it's been a long time since the faculty has been able to undertake a renovation or renewal of our clinical spaces with this scope. Many of you may know that we renovated our entire research operations in 2018, reconfiguring 95 cluttered and crowded labs into 21 spectacular larger facilities that feature modernized research labs and expanded usable space. This has inspired increased collaboration and enhanced quality of research. This was really the first phase of our plans to renovate 124 Edward Street. Since the renovation of the research facilities, which really came into being because we were planning the renovation of our research facilities and the government created a program to support universities with their research infrastructure, because we had already begun our planning, we were ready to act. And dentistry was actually selected as the host faculty for the president and government visit and ribbon cutting for all the labs that were renovated across U of T's three campuses. What, in what we call our second phase, we refresh our library spaces in coordination with the U of T libraries in 2019 and are currently creating our MDR medical reprocessing device to provide state-of-the-art central sterilization. This should be ready for the fall as will be a renovation of our auditorium. New lighting, brand new and modernized AV equipment will be integrated into the space. New furniture was purchased in 2019 and new walls treatments will be added. The auditorium is a high value space for us as it is really our own multi-use 
space and is heavily used when the school is open. It will become a welcoming, fresh and attractive space for all to enjoy. A new space is more than just a new space. It lifts people's expectations and enables greater capacity when things are in their place. We are now at a time in large part due to COVID-19 when it's no longer nice to have, but essential to have unclosed operatories to ensure the future sustainability and excellence expected from UFT dentistry. The satellite clinic project was born from months of discussions and studies to try and figure out how we could enclose operatories within our own building during the academic year and be ready for next year. Because of the sheer scope of the project, it was not feasible both from an operational perspective and timeline. As you can see here, the size of Clinic 2 and open, how open it is. Knowing that we will have a third phase of our renovations that would include the simulation lab and Clinic 2, the concept of building an off-site clinic provided solutions to a number of issues. First, because the satellite clinic is being built in an empty space in a more modern building, it was far quicker to renovate than trying to reach retrofit the existing building. Second, it will provide us the swing space to move clinical operations when lab four and clinic two are being decommissioned and renovated to allow for the continued teaching and patient care. With this, I will pass it over to Dr. Poslins to take us through the presentation of the satellite clinic. Jim. Thank you, Mary and Selena, and thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. And coming from you live from the beautiful clinic director's office, 124 Edward Street. We are all using the word excited a lot these days, but this is for good reason. This is a fabulous project. I've worked on the clinic plan with several awesome members of our team, with the consultants and with the architects to ensure that the new space will facilitate the needs of the faculty going forward. So without further ado, it is my pleasure and my honor to do, introduce everyone to the Faculty of Dentistry's newest endeavor, the Satellite Clinic, located at 777 Bay Street. The clinic is located at the southeast corner of Bay and College, a short walk from 124 Edward. We sourced a location that was within walking distance of the school since students and instructors will need to be on campus and within reach of other clinics on a daily basis. Also, it needed to be accessible for our patients. Yes, after 60 years, the Faculty of Dentistry is finally right atop the TTC line at College Street Station. The offsite clinic <coughs> also has other benefits. As Mary mentioned, we were able to secure a space in which we could build a clinic relatively quickly. It's a blank slate, if you will. So we are located on the 22nd floor, complete with beautiful, expensive, oh, sorry, I mean expansive, sorry, Mary, views of the city. This space will also serve as swing space as Mary said, when we undertake the anticipated revitalization of Lab 4, also known as the Simulation Lab, and then Clinic 2. The satellite clinic will house the DDS-4 AGP clinics. There are 120 DDS-4 students registered per year. At each clinical session, 80 students will work in tandem to maximize their clinical experiences. There will be two to three sessions scheduled per day for five days per week. There will also be a number of late afternoon or evening appointments scheduled as well. With this, we expect to offer approximately 12,000 patient appointments in the clinic over the course of a year. So it's going to be a busy place. Let's take a look at the floor plan. This is a fully functional dental clinic encompassing just over 19,000 square feet. The colors represent the standard operatories are pink, the accessible operatories are yellow, the reception and the office spaces are green, the student and staff support spaces are blue, the clinic support spaces are purple. The mechanical and IT spaces are navy. And finally, for the first time in a long time, 
The, the Faculty of Dentistry will have ample restroom facilities for everyone, and that's the turquoise color. Because the, all the operatories are enclosed, there's a number of hallways, and so it's important that everybody follows the proper pathways in and out of the clinic. So instructors and students will have their own FOB access. Please do not forget your FOB when you're on site. Upon entry, instructors and students can store their belongings in an available lockable day locker. They will change into scrubs and designating changing areas across from the lockers and then enter the clinic using the south hallway. All users will stop at the PPE station to pick up over gowns and required PPE and then head over to their assigned operatories. At the end of the day, the PPE is docked at the PPE docking station and then everyone will exit the clinic the same way they came in. Patient access is similarly defined. Patients enter and exit the clinic in a controlled manner. They exit off the main elevator and can only enter into the clinic via the reception area where they will check in with the receptionist. They will then be escorted by a student to their assigned operatory for their procedure. When they leave, they are escorted back to the main reception for payment and then dismissal. There are 35 standard operatories arranged in groups of 10. The ops are fully enclosed on all four sides and the enclosures go right up to the ceiling. One of the walls is glass while the other three are drywall. A large sliding glass door will allow one to access, access the op from the lateral side. <clears throat> Within the op is a standard ADEC dental chair and operator stool in one of the four, in one of four beautiful bright colors of the rainbow. The delivery system is over the patient and has integral fiber optic and bottled water delivery cooling system. Behind the chair is a full length counter and a cabinet that serves as the base for the computer to run an Axiom or clinic management system and a hand washing sink. Above the counter is an enclosed PPE and paper towel cabinet. Students and staff are gonna love this. All opera are equipped with an automated dental line cleaning system. In addition to the standard op, there are four larger A, ODA accessible operatories. In addition to the standard equipment, these operatories are also equipped with digital radiography. Access to radiography and a slightly larger footprint makes these ops ideal for endodontic microscopy. In addition to the four accessible operatories, there are also two standard operatories also equipped with radiography for overflow purposes. These are the architect's artistic renderings of the operatories from the exterior and interior. If you want the room with a view, be sure and book early. This is the location of the patient reception area. The desk will accommodate up to two receptionists and house two computer terminals. Patients will check in and check out here. There's ample patient seating around the perimeter. Since there, is, since there is an expansive food court in the basement of the building, complete with a Tim Hortons, it is our hope that patients do not spend a great deal of time waiting in the reception area before their appointments, spend a little bit more time down in the food court. There's a student locker room with ample uh, multiple day lockers, electronic device charging stations, and seating. There's a similar, albeit smaller area for instructors and staff. These are the lockable unisex changing areas or changing rooms for changing into clinical scrubs before the day's procedures. There's a lunch and a lounge area to be used for breaks and also for instructors to tap in and tap out of using the chrono system. There's a small office to be used by the lead dental assistant. And there's a designated workstation that has computers and has for use by students, staff and instructors. There's also space for uh, one to plug in a laptop if, if one desires. This is nicely located because there's ac access to a printer in the reception area. There's a small meeting room that seats approximately five people. <clears throat> uh, so I think we're one slide ahead, sorry. I'll just go uh, back one. Thank you. <clears throat> Entering into the clinical area, there's a technical support lab for pouring up models, adjusting acrylic, and other minor lab procedures to support the clinical activities. Across the hall, there's a designated CAD CAM room to house the scanners and the milling machines, and we're hoping that we can make greater use of this facility uh, as days come by. This is the clean PPE room that I mentioned earlier. 
where all clinical users will stop to obtain their PPEs. So we'll have the overgowns there, we'll have head coverings, we'll have masks, and then they can don them at this point and then move into the clinic. This is the clinic dispensary. It is open on two sides. And this is the architect's rendering of the dispensary. The south opening contains a series of cubbies where the students will pick up their pre-ordered instruments. <clears throat> the opening on the west wall is for picking up large pieces of equipment, materials, and extra instruments as required. And that's very similar to our large openings at 124. This is the instrument return area. As a matter of course and overall efficiency, the vast majority of the instruments will be reprocessed in our brand new central MDR located in the main building at 124 Edward Streets. Instruments will travel by specialized courier daily back and forth between the two sites. Students will return their kits to this room where the kits and instruments will be scanned back to the case cards. If there are some items that need to be reprocessed quickly, it can be done on site. <clears throat> These items will be diverted to an automated melee instrument washing, washing machine and then be delivered to the sterilization center through a pass-through. This is a small sterilization center where diverted instruments can be packaged, sterilized, and returned to the dispensary for storage. This is a designated PPE docking and return area. And the mechanical room that contains a compressor, vacuum, pump, and amalgam separator. So again, this is just a final summary of the, all the pieces of this exciting new venture. This really is the faculty's baby, the conception to reality in less than a year. I cannot wait for the fall till the delivery. So now I'll turn it over to Selena for a bit of a chat. Thank you. Thank you. Geez, we, we zipped through that presentation pretty quickly. And um, I actually, I want us to go back, if Rochelle, do you don't mind showing people the operatories again, because I think that they are the most exciting thing to see. Um, and I just want to point out, you know, obviously they're enclosed, but people, sorry, Rochelle, I'll let you fly us back there. Yeah. So, yeah, perfect. So I think what people can see here, you know, what's different um, in this space, of course, is that they're fully enclosed, which is going to be the future of dentistry. So those huge open clinics that we have at the faculty, um, you know, have obviously posed a massive challenge for us you know, during COVID. And so what's so spectacular about this is the glass doors that can open and close. Obviously we're enclosed, but still allows for great instruction and teaching because um, they're transparent. So I just sort of wanted to, to point that out to people. And because um, Rochelle, the next one um, is so pretty, because we're up on that 22nd floor, as Jim says, book early for your room with the view. But, you know, what's going to be so fun for us is that we are really within walking distance of main um, campus for our faculty, but they've kind of, the students are going to have this wonderful opportunity um, to sort of experience other parts of the city. So um, I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention because I'm so excited about the renderings piece, but uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, Rochelle. Um, anything we didn't sort of touch on, Jim or Mary, that we wanted to kind of cover off now that we've kind of ran through it? Feel good? Okay. So we did, we did get a couple questions. Um, and, you know, I feel like we've touched on these things, but we moved through this kind of quickly. So uh, one of the key questions was, when will this be ready? So, Jim, I will actually let you answer that one first off the bat. Um, well, our plan was to have it ready for the beginning of the academic year, which is essentially September the 1st. And I believe that we're still on schedule. So this is an extremely tight timeline and uh, almost unprecedented by the university. <clears throat> so we kept this, this entire clinic. It's going to be quite, I think it's going to be quite beautiful, but it's quite simple. Uh, it's elegantly simple, is, uh, I guess. <laughs> uh, it, uh, we say the same thing about you, Jim. <laughs> Maybe simple, but not elegant. <laughs> um, so I think because of that, the construction is rel like relatively uh, you know, straightforward. I mean, I say that as not a construction person, but um, mm -hmm. overly complicated. We don't have a lot of, like, we're not running nitrous through it. We're not, um, all the, there's no water lines to the, to the chairs. They're all self-contained with bottle system. Um, and there's not a lot of really fancy furnishing. So uh, for that end, I think we can stay on schedule. Uh, the university, the central campus knows how important this is for us to be up and ready for um, uh, the beginning of the academic year. And we have a great project planner who's right on the ball. And so I think she's going to keep things moving along really well. I don't know if there's anything to add. It's awesome. Thank you. 
Oh, you're on mute, Mary. Never fails. <laughs> yeah. it's okay. So, I mean, it's an incredibly aggressive timeline. Um, you know, we made a decision to do the offsite um, clinic in November. Well, we made it in consultation with the university. So something like this would take six months for university to approve, but we are doing it, you know, we, we start looking for the space, got the lease, you know, hire the consultant, hire the, con I mean, everything was done within two months, which, which is incredible. And then we are even getting lucky to get the city permits. There were, it required three different permits, uh, demolition and construction um, and something else. Uh, and we, apparently we have them all now. So we are, um, we will be going into construction. At, I believe demolition is done by now and going into construction. So we're really hoping that it will be all fitted in August and be operational in September. Amazing. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Jim. Um, Jim, also on your on your uh, little joke about it being expensive and expansive, I am going to be, I'll be coming for you to name one of our operatories. So I was I was honestly a slip of the tongue. I did. Really... <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. So um, you know. I think part of this too, because we have been, I know that this has been an aggressive timeline to get the satellite clinic. So it begs the question, I think on, why does it take so long to get our clinics done within the 124 Edwards Street building? And maybe um, Mary, I can ask you to approach that question. Yeah, so, I mean, um, you know, the, you can imagine renovating clinics within the old building like ours is very complicated and can be very costly. So the cost has always been a factor for us. Um, but so it's when we plan renovation, it's not just the uh, configuring or upgrading space, but because it's an old building, we have to uh, replace or upgrade all our infrastructure like HVAC and electric panels. And so it's, it's very complicated. and. And also, you know, unlike um, the other, you know, just classroom renovations or seminar room renovation, even lab renovation, uh, the, the dental clinic has a lot, it's a huge equipment cost when we do renovation. And this, again, staging is, is a big deal, um, trying to stage the clinic um, renovation at the same time, we have to continue with the full clinical education and patient care. So it takes a time to plan and it takes a time to go through proper um, approval process within university capital project framework. Um, but certainly uh, having the satellite clinic will make it easier for us um, for, the, for the next uh, projects like lab four and clinic two. Yeah, yeah, provides swing space effectively. I mean, I think what I've always, often heard is, I mean, obviously cost is a factor for sure because they're also just massive. Like can anybody imagine renovating a 70 chair clinic and turning it into a 120 chair clinic? I mean, it's gonna be expensive, um, but also just what do we do with the program? Where do, where do they go? So being able to move the sim lab into clinic two, and then clinic two, once the sim lab's built, people in clinic two can be offloaded into the satellite clinic spaces and different sort of scheduling can help solve our problems. I think it's really interesting. Um, so another question that came in, which is interesting is, so if this was easier and less expensive to build a satellite clinic, why not just move, why, why bother with the 124 dentistry building at all? And why not just go external then, find, find community satellite clinics all over the place? Mary, maybe I, sorry, I'm going to tap you on this one again, Mary. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I think I, I believe it has been our objective to keep our research, teaching, and clinic all in one space for many good reasons. So the faculty has the space and services and is in a location that supports our patient population and, of course, is most convenient 
for the students to all be in the same location. And also if we are to lease external uh, space, which is not university owned properties like our building, we'll have to pay lease cost. And that can be very costly, you know, in place like Toronto for the kind of space we're looking for. So um, it's, I'm not sure if that is an alternative, um, feasible alternative for us. Um, but I mean, you know, the dentist space needs and renovation has always been part of university planning office plan. So we are always on their radar. And at University of Toronto, the space and facilities are very fast moving <laughs> target. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're seeing loads of questions actually zipping in here. So, um, uh, one of the questions, and I think you touched on it, Jim, through the presentation, but will third and fourth year be working together in this new satellite clinic? I think the answer is yes on that, right? That's correct. I mean, uh, we are still working out the scheduling, but okay. uh, most likely third and fourth will be together at some point, and sometimes it will maybe just fourth and fourth, depending on what their examination schedules are, are like and their rotations and their own responsibilities. Right. Uh, you know, at this point, when we first started, it's going to be focused on uh, DDS4. Okay. But right. whether or not the third years go in and, and assist at that point, uh, we're still working at it. Okay. You're not expecting first and second, I mean, first year's preclinical and most of second year's preclinical, so they won't necessarily be in that space? Um, I wouldn't rule it out 100%. I mean, yeah. we, uh, the first and second years always have assisting duties and things like that, uh, rotations, and so um, as sort of clinic two sort of winds down, and uh, we use it as swing space for the lab four uh, renovation, and the first and second years are going to need space to do their own experiences. So it's very cool that they can end over there doing some assisting as well. Yep. Yep. Terrific. Um, I have an interesting, this is an interesting question. I'm not sure if we can get into this, but um, given the province wide shortage of dental auxiliary staff and the benefit of forehanded dentistry in a post COVID clinical setting to increase practice safety, has any consideration been given to opening up a pilot project of a dental assisting program at the fac at, in these new facilities. Um, I'm, I'm throwing that out to Jim. I don't know. No, <laughs> that's that's really for Jean. <laughs> it's an excellent question. And you know what? For the first time, I actually we actually sort of mentioned that today at one of the meetings we were at. So it's a very friendly question. Uh, it is possible because we know that uh, the way the, the clinic, the way we schedule our students, uh, it's it's. Um, usually it's half the class at a time. And so half of the 120 is 60. And if fourth years are assisting fourth years, it's only 30 patients that can be treated. Mm. So potentially saying, hey, maybe we should have the dental assisting students back and run a little program in there to train dental assistants um, to make up the difference. So we're not dealing with, so we can have 40 students doing 40 clinical procedures. We really. You know, assisting is great, and it's a great clinical experience you can learn as an assistant, but, you know, we want our third and fourth students to be doing as much dentistry as possible as the operator. Right. So uh, that was mentioned today, and uh, it's a great question. So uh, yeah. it's something that we might consider. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting, right? Yeah, so no firm plans, but yeah, it's something to consider. I appreciate that. So a few people have actually um, want some clarification on the life of service of this clinic. So we said for at least the next decade, um, but they're asking whether this is now becoming uh, a permanent piece to our clinical operations or is it really temporary? Mary, I'll pop that to you. Well, I mean, I think the lease is for 10 years. Um, we, uh, we, I'm not sure. I think just for five years, uh, we will use it for staging because we do have a plan to renovate number of places in our current building. Um, so I don't know really. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, Jim, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I think, I think uh, we were committed for sure for five years, 100%. Uh, we know what our, how complex the renovations at 124 are. So I think our expectation is that we're going to go, you know, somewhere, you know, into into 10 years. I think that's sort of where we want to end up. And your point, Mary, about having to rent space 
uh, with, with, a, with a lease is expensive. And I think, you know, with every downside, there's kind of an upside. And so because of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a lot of space available. Um, and a lot of companies not using their space efficiently. So there are subleases around and leases and all these sorts of things. And so timing is everything. We were able to move into a, a great space at, I'm going to say, a relatively competitive rates. But, you know, five years from now or 10 years from now, it could be totally different. And it may just be too cost prohibitive. And we are spending a lot of resource, planning to spend a lot of resources here. So I think our objective is to get back here as quick as we can. So going beyond 10 years, I, I really can't see that if, if we can avoid it. Yeah. Um, speaking of cost, actually, a cost did come in um, that's inquiring about the cost and scope of the project and um, how it's being funded. So I, I wonder if I can approach Mary on that one. Um, we are, you know, we are, we, the, the faculty always has some capital reserve. Um, so we are using some of that money. Uh, we've been very lucky. Uh, we, we have been uh, supported by uh, Central um, with many, I mean, our MDR is, is been funded by Provost. Um, so we, we are getting quite a, a lot of support from University Central. So it's a combination of, um, you know, the faculty capital reserve and central support. And um, I mean, I think Jim is right. One of the silver linings of pandemic is there, there, there are all these spaces available which would not have been available prior yeah. to pandemic. And we were able to um, uh, negotiate. So uh, in terms of a construction, we are letting the land roll, uh, that's the uh, construction, for, for not only for the timeline purpose, but also, um, you know, potentially can be cheaper that way. So, yeah, so. That's how it's gone. Yeah. You know, and, and um, you know, importantly too, I think for people though, we haven't sort of worked them out specifically, but, you know, philanthropy, you know, finds its way into everything that we do. So certainly we depend on our community, our alumni, our faculty and staff, and just our friends in the community and our corporate partners to help support us. So there are naming opportunities um, potentially available for different operatories. We're not sure if we're able to name the satellite clinic yet. Um, U of T has certain sort of rules around that uh, because it's, a, it's meant to be a temporary space. It's more like you would name clinic two, for example, because it would last forever. Um, but philanthropy could feature into some of the funding on this as well. So um, one of the questions, which was interesting, and it's so it's it's about staging and timelines of renovation. So um, as the satellite clinics are set to take off soon. Oh, no, nope, sorry. That's geez. The questions are flying. I had my eyes on one. It was around. Um, not shutting down clinic two in the sim lab just as students are trying to get their competencies in three and four and so the sight line i know on the sim lab and clinic two is a few years away it's not happening like next year and so mary maybe you can talk a little bit about um you know where we're at right now mdr and auditorium is happening we're hoping to open in the fall with the satellite lab and then when do we think sim lab and clinic two is going to happen like from a year's you know, your timeline perspective? Yeah, so it's been very, very busy year. Um, so the, as you said, auditorium and MDR construction are going on right now. We are hoping um, they will be fully functional in fall this year. And then satellite will be functional this September. Uh, we are actively planning uh, lab four and clinic two renovations. Um, so if all goes well, um, the lab four uh, will be renovated in 2022-23 academic year and clinic two in 2024. That's, that's the timeline we're working with right now. Um, and I'm seeing lots of questions. I think we have a fair number of students on, but um, whether tuitions are going to be impacted by the building of, of the satellite clinic. 
Uh, short answer is no. Yeah. No, tuition so, is, 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 as you all know, is regulated by provincial government and it, it has nothing to do with any capital project we, uh, we take on. Great, thanks, Mary. Um, Jim, this might be a question um, for you. So is booking a chair at the satellite clinic going to be done on a first come first serve basis or will all students be given a priority time slot similar to how AGP time slots are now conducted? Um, I think that, so the question is, uh, is it booking a first come first serve? Uh, yes, or like, how is, how is it going to roll out? How will a third or fourth year be able to book a chair in the new satellite clinic? Yeah, I think um, we're working at the scheduling right now. Uh, it's a whole new thing, because again, it's, it's only 40 chairs. It's not half the class, so it's a new way of scheduling. Mm -hmm. We run the way that we've been running it here uh, with a very limited number of AGP uh, operatories available to the undergrad clinic. So we're going from 16 um, between 16 and 25, depending on the time of day that we have right now for a class of 120 to 40, and 40 really, because we're going to keep it uh, random numbers, 41 is a lot, uh, so with, with uh, 40, so it's going to be a regular sort of scheduling. Now, that doesn't mean that the students are going to end up with the same operatory every single time that they go. The operatories are very simple. There's, there's no storage in them. They're, they're, they're really, they're, they're multifunctional. You can do perio on them. You can do endo on them. You can do operative, prosto. So the whole idea being that um, there'll be regular scheduling, but I, I would be surprised if the students have the same operatory every time, which is one of the reasons why we went with the bright colors or I sort of mentioned very quickly the four colors of the rainbow, uh, because it's going to be, they're all enclosed. And so, you know, it's not like you're always going to operatory, you know, 25 every single time you go as a student. You might be in the green section or in the yellow section or the red section. And so, uh, you know, for identification purposes, that's sort of what we're going to do. The exact scheduling we haven't quite worked out yet, but uh, no, it won't be first come first serve. That that would be really stressful for the students. Uh, they'll have time that they can do. It'll be a little bit more like like the way things were before. Thanks, Jim. Um, uh, I see a question actually, and it's kind of a COVID type question with limited people per elevator. Um, will it become a challenge for patients and staff to get to the 22nd floor on time? What do you think about that? It's a great question. Uh, um, we're going to hold a race every day to see who can... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but hopefully, uh, you know, with the vaccinations and um, with uh, you know, better controls and everybody wearing masks and things like that, herd immunity, all that sort of thing, hopefully the, the elevators uh, will be enough to service us. The elevators in that building, I mean, I've only been there a couple of times uh, to check the site out there. They're quite fast, and there's a, a, a number of them. It's, it's, I think it's a government building, so it's pretty well uh, put together. So I don't think it's going to be too bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's the hope. And, and you plan accordingly, right? I mean, this is the nightmare of any elevator in the city of Toronto when you have to go more than two stories, right? You, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a question actually about um, centralized scheduling system. And I know we've talked a lot about scheduling, but um, will students be scheduling their own patients for the satellite, uh, satellite clinic separately, or is it through the centralized scheduling system? Uh, well, we're going to use the Axiom scheduler. Yeah. You know okay. we do. Uh, it would be very similar to the way uh, patients were scheduled in clinic one or clinic two. I mean, I don't really know the details to be perfectly honest because we haven't totally worked it out, the workflow, uh, but uh, students will be scheduling their own patients and uh, there'll probably be a schedule for um, the uh, satellite clinic within Axiom. The other thing too, is we're gonna have a lead dental assistant and two receptionists who will be there to help the students. What's really important is that when a patient is scheduled there, they know to go there. Uh, because the sessions sometimes are short. They're sometimes they're, uh, when we have three sessions, they're only two and a half hours long. I can see a disaster happening. The, the patient ends up in the wrong place and then has to spend half an hour getting to the right place and then the student's uh, half an hour behind. So if the student is scheduling the patient, which would be the best, then they can tell and make sure that the patient knows which building to go to because there may be times when they're in clinic one in 124 and there may be times when they're at the satellite clinic. And so uh, that communication is, is key. 
And I, I would imagine that there'll be materials and, and narrative and language that the students will have for yeah, providing to the patients yeah. where they're at. Um, and so there was a question, and again, I think we've kind of covered this, but um, the satellite clinic will be ready for AGPs. That much is clear. Will some clinical procedures still be done at 124 Edward? I know the answer is yes, but I'm going to let you elaborate on that, Jim. Yeah, um, some of the procedures, uh, because again, it's only 41 chairs, so it's not to support the DDS3 and DDS4 class, even with pairing up students. So yes, uh, treatment, treatment, some treatments will be carrying on in, in uh, clinic one and also in the pediatric clinic. Um, you know, we're hoping that we get to be able to use some open operatories again, uh, to go for enhanced precautions. Um, but for sure, things like treatment planning, uh, simple perio examinations, or oral diagnosis, all these sorts of things can be done as non-aging clinics. The question is, how many patients can we put in the clinic? And we're not quite sure where we're going to be in September. Uh, right now, it's, it's um, fairly restricted. And so, you know, if we can get up right now, I think we're running about 50% capacity. If we can get up around 75, even or even back to 100% uh, with non-AGP, that would be a, a huge boon to the, to the class. Fantastic. Um, I did get a request to show the artistic interpretation again, um, but what I will just say is we've recorded this session. Um, we're going to put it up on our YouTube channel so people can come to it at any point and we'll send it out to everybody on the call as well. Um, and also in our next uh, alumni e-newsletter, which is also going to, we'll, we can send it out to students, faculty, staff, um, and also the next issue of the U of T Dentistry Magazine, we have a whole bunch of these pictures. And in fact, it's not in the next e-newsletter, so I'm sorry about that, but it will be in the next magazine. We're doing a spread on the satellite clinic. So um, you'll be able to see those um, as well. And you can always reach out to us in our office and I can share pictures with you. So, um, I feel like we've sort of covered covered the gamut and I'm not seeing any more, oh my goodness, ping pongs come in. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll close our evening, but certainly if other questions come up, um, surely with projects like this, people have questions and it is so exciting for everybody. Um, I think it's really going to make huge difference um, to our capacity at the faculty and uh, it's an exciting time to be here. And I am also just so delighted to again share, and I think we've talked about this this evening, is how supportive the overall university has been from our faculty um, to our faculty and all of the support that they've given us, not only from funding perspective, but also just with the planning. I mean, they really have been absolutely amazing understanding how incredibly impacted our faculty has been through the pandemic. Um, you know, dentistry is unique for, for many reasons, but certainly through COVID, um, against any of the other faculties at U of T, our operations have been really, really impacted. And so the, the university has gotten behind us 100% to make sure that for next academic year, we're ready to roll. So um, I think that that's just a spectacular thing. So really, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Mary and Jim, really appreciate your insight. I mean, as leads on this project, you guys are living this every day and have been doing so for years as we have been planning our building and then COVID hits and now we have the satellite clinic, but um, we just all appreciate so much that you guys are here sharing all of this information. And I appreciate all of our students, our faculty, um, our staff, students, everybody who has joined us this evening. Um, like I said, we will definitely send you out a survey. Um, we're interested in your feedback and as well, we will be posting this on our YouTube channel. So until we can see all each other again in person, stay healthy and safe. Thank you again for joining us. Good night. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Yeah.